Hello, everyone. This is Liz again with the Magnolia Business Alliance. We're going to go ahead and start the program. If you're joining us late, just please be sure that your phone is muted. A um, couple of things before we begin. We will be taking questions during the webinar. If you would type your questions in the chat window, it's located on the right-hand side in your toolbar. Joel Lawhead, our ch the Chief Information Officer for Envision Solutions, We'll be answering those questions as they come up um, during the webinar. We will also have a question and answer period at the end where uh, we'll allow you to ask the questions directly using your telephone or your microphone. Our presenter today is Mark Stevens. He's the Chief Proposal Manager for Envision Solutions. Um, he is very experienced in proposal writing, and I think you're going to learn a lot um, today. We welcome everybody. We hope that you enjoy it. Um, there will be a um, follow-up email in the next couple of days with a survey and some instructions on how you can um, get the PowerPoint slides and the recording of this webinar so that you'll have it on hand um, whenever you need it. So now I'm going to turn the program over to Mark. And again, if you have any questions, just type them in the chat window on the right side of your screen. Hi, everybody. Um, as Liz said, I'm Mark Stevens. I manage proposals for uh, Envision Solutions. I've been doing that for about five years now. Um, and over the process, um, we've learned some stuff here that um, we felt like the, uh, the Magnolia Business Alliance members uh, would be able to benefit from, and so we want to share those with you. Uh, like she said, if you have any questions, type them into the question box on the right side. Um, or you can wait till the end, and we'll we'll answer those as they come. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started now. So first, I want to uh, to show you kind of uh, what the outline is for today. Um, we're going to be talking about um, what is a proposal, uh, what is an RFP. That's a term that you'll hear a lot. Um, how do I know what the government wants? Um, what do they want to hear? How should I write? And what should my schedule look like? And all of these questions are based off of, you know, when um, proposals can be very intimidating, um, writing and dealing with the federal government. And these are all questions that came out of our experience. You know, when I first started out, um, it was just kind of a jump in with both feet thing. And I had to learn a lot of these things as we went. And so um, these are all just questions that um, we feel like would be beneficial to, to someone just starting out. And so we kind of take a... Um, this is kind of a pro pro proposal, proposals 101 type situation where we're doing um, a lot of basic stuff. If you have more advanced questions, um, you can ask those or email them to us. We'll, we'll show the information at the end. Um, or we, um, if there's enough interest, we may uh, do another advanced proposals webinar later on. Um, but these are all the, the questions that we hope to answer today. Now, these are some terms that you'll hear uh, throughout um, even just dealing with proposals, you'll hear these terms. Uh, some of them we're going to use today. Some of them we won't go over in depth. Um, but I just wanted to introduce you to some of these because uh, the longer you deal with the federal government, um, you're going to hear these um, sooner or later. Um, wind themes, that's just a theme that um, you want to go throughout your entire proposal. So if you're really, um, you have really great certifications or something like that, um, you want to use that as a theme. Um, to win the business, and so you want to spread that throughout your entire proposal. Don't just put it in one spot. Storyboard, that's a fancy um, way to say an outline. Um, uh, sometimes your outline goes into more depth and you have a little bit of content, the main points you want to put um, under each section. That's called a storyboard. You want to do that as early as possible and then use it, to keep referring back to that as you write the proposal. Team reviews, there's a lot of different terms for these. Um, some people use a color system. Um, they'll say a red team review or a pink team review, something like that. Um, the colors are not important. Those are just made up. Um, you can use whatever terms you want, but you may hear about those um, as you deal with this stuff. So I wanted to introduce you to those, and we'll talk more about that later. Um, a blackout, that's a period where you're not allowed to, uh, the federal government is not allowed to give you any information. They'll have a specific period. Um, when they issue an RFP uh, for you to ask questions. Uh, once that period is over, they're not allowed to communicate with you because it would give 
one company an unfair advantage over another. Tag up is just a meeting. Um, if you're working with a large proposal team or if you have um, multiple companies working together on an effort, um, a tag up is just a meeting where everybody gets together and, um, and just kind of gets on the same page and makes sure everything's going smoothly. Data call, um, that's just when you have, uh, again, if you're working on a large team or something, you'll issue somebody a data call and you'll say, okay, we need um, section three written by Friday. And so on Friday, um, that person should have that section written. That's called a data call. Ghosting, we'll talk more about later. Um, that is just a way that you can um, <clears throat> minimize uh, your competitor's strengths. Um, you can kind of speak to those or call out their weaknesses without mentioning them directly. And then uh, WBS is a work breakdown structure. That's basically just an outline of the work that's going to be accomplished. Sometimes that'll be given to you in the RFP. Sometimes you'll have to come up with it yourself, but you may see that term. And then uh, the various terms for for a federal procurement, um, you may it, they may call it an RFP. That's request for proposal. Um, those are pretty standard. That's what you're going to see most often. Um, request for quote, very similar. It's going to be much shorter, though, generally. Um, they generally don't want a lot of technical information with a request for quote. It will just be um, your price, usually. And a request for information. A lot of times before they get ready to issue an RFP for an actual job, then they'll issue an RFI that just, um, that's just them testing the waters to see what companies are out there. Um, that can, they think can do the job. So that's just a list of terms there real quick. Um, some of them we'll go into more depth, some of them we won't. If you have any questions about those, um, you can ask. Or if there's another term that I mentioned that you don't understand, please ask. So what is a proposal? Um, a proposal, the federal government, this is kind of a theme that we'll talk about um, throughout the presentation, but the federal government does not buy things the way that you and I buy things. Um, they go through a very rigorous um, very specific process anytime they have to buy something. I mean, that's good. We don't want the federal government wasting our taxpayer dollars, and so they have a lot of regulations that are, um, that are put on them. All of those regulations are contained in what's called the FAR. That's the Federal Acquisition Regulations. Um, and so the FAR lays out how they go through this process. So your proposal is the way they base their, their decision to buy something on. They may get two, uh, two proposals from different companies. They may get 10 or 15. And so the proposal is the only way they have to judge your company. They're not allowed to use any external information um, outside of your proposal, usually. And so those, those three to 15 proposals is all they have to go on. So you want to make sure that everything you need to sell them is in that document. Um, and it's Again, it's your, um, it's your chance to sell your company. As, as small business owners, as entrepreneurs, you're very good at this. You do this all the time. Um, anybody you meet um, at a baseball game or at church or whatever, you're constantly telling people about your company. Um, you do it every day. A proposal is just a place where you formalize all of that information that you like to tell people, put it down in a document um, for the government to read and hopefully choose your company. The thing to remember is um, the proposal is a legal document. Um, so don't go overboard. Don't promise things that you can't deliver. A lot, of, a lot of agencies these days are including the proposal directly in the, in the contract. When you sign a contract, the proposal will be an attachment. That way, um, anything uh, that you, you promise um, can be a contract deliverable. So make sure that everything you say in there is true and that everything that you promised them, you're able to deliver. Proposals are about risk. And again, this is another theme that will go throughout the, throughout the presentation today. But um, especially as a small business, the government views um, contractors as risky. They don't know what they're getting. And so what they will do is um, they're trying to minimize their risk whenever they buy something. They have other factors that are, that are pushing on them. They have cost. Uh, they may have metrics, especially as a small business. They may have um, an agency that says you need to use 10% uh, small business for your work this year. Uh, but really, risk is the most important factor. And so as a, um, as a small business especially, you need to constantly be um, 
reminding them that you are not risky and giving them concrete ways um, that you are going to be able to deliver on what you say you can do. And there's a couple of different ways, a um, couple of different aspects to risk that are important. Um, the technical and management risk, and a lot of times proposals will be divided up into these sections just like you see them here, technical and management, past performance, and cost. Um, those are generally the main sections of a proposal. They may be divided up differently from one to the next, but generally that's what you'll see. And so in each section, they're trying to get at um, a different type of risk, and so you need to keep that in mind as you write. Um, the technical and management risk, what they're trying to figure out is, could a competent contractor do what you say that you're going to do? They don't know if you can do it. Um, they just want to know, could it be done this way? So if we use the example of painting a house, um, let's say you get ready to paint your house and you get three bids from different companies in town. Um, one guy says, okay, I'm going um, to get brushes, I'm going to get the paint, I'm going to get all the trays, um, I'm going to come out, I'm going to lay cloth down, I'm going to paint, I'm going to clean up. The next guy says, okay, I don't use brushes, I have spray, and I come out and I cover this and I spray, and then I do the trim and, and that. Um, that's a different way to do it. And then the third guy says, well, I'm going to take water balloons and fill them with paint and throw them at your house until it's all covered. Um, you would say, I don't think that method is going to work. And so that's what the government is looking for in your technical and management section. How risky is the way they have proposed to do it? And so when you propose a method, if you say, I'm going to use brushes, you need to prove that that method works. Um, and that kind of leads into the past performance. Um, what um, the past performance section is going to tell the government um, that I can do it the way I have proposed. So in the technical, they say, okay, could someone do it the way they have proposed? Yes. Now, could, can this company do it the way they have proposed? And the way you do that is you tell them about all the projects that you've worked on in the past. Sometimes as a new business, you won't have a lot of past performance. Um, that's okay. Generally, pat, not having past performance um, doesn't hurt you. It can only help you. Um, so you need to try to tell the story the best that you can. And one of the great things you can do is, um, even though these are separate sections, you want to intertwine them. So in your uh, technical section, when you're talking about um, how th your method is the, using brushes is the best way to do it, um, you want to tie that back to your past performance and say, well, in this project and this project and this project, I used brushes and everything worked out great and the customer was happy. So um, you want to make sure that you cross-pollinate those sections. Um, and then cost. Um, cost is a risk to the government as well. Um, just because you're the lowest cost doesn't mean you're going to win. Um, it, you know, you think about, again, the house painting example. If you had a guy who said he was going to paint your whole house for $50, that's kind of one of those too-good-to-be-true situations. And the government looks at that as well. So they want to know that um, you can do it, that you've done it before. Um, but if you propose your cost too low, then that represents a risk to them too. So be careful about that. So what is an RFP? RFP is a request for proposal. We talked about that. It's, what, it's how the government tells you what they want. Um, it's going to contain... Um, a lot of different sections. Some of them are long, some of them are short, um, anywhere from three to a hundred pages on a large um, effort. Um, but they're all going to contain, contain basically the same sections because, again, that's regulated by the FAR. So um, there's rules and regulations in there. You're going to find instructions. Sometimes there'll be forms to fill out, so you need to keep an eye out for those. And they're going to tell you what work um, needs to be completed. Now, all these RFPs are different. Some are very high quality, some are very vague. Um, I've selected an example that I'm going to show you later of a really, a really great RFP that's very specific. Um, you're not always going to get something that great, um, but hopefully they're going to tell you, give you a good idea of the work to be completed. So these are the sections um, that are in an RFP. And again, these are regulated by the FAR, so you'll find these in just about every proposal, every uh, RFP you work with. Um, and especially as a new, uh, if, you're, if you're new to dealing with the federal government, you're going to want to read every section in great detail. Um, however, 
That being said, I've highlighted or put in bold here the most important sections. They're all important. Don't hear me say that you don't need to worry about uh, Section E. But um, the, the sections that you're going to spend the most time in when you're writing your proposals are Section C. That's where they're going to tell you, that's where they're going to have the work statement. They're going to tell you the work to be done. Again, you hope it's very specific. Sometimes it's not. Uh, J is very helpful because that's where they have a list of attachments. Um, you're going to want to look through that and make sure that you have all those attachments. If you're missing one of those, um, you need to, to go find it. Usually there will be, a, um, there'll be a, con a point of contact that you can go to for those things if you can't find one of these attachments. Um, there's also Section K, that's representations and certifications. This is important as a small business uh, because, um, again, the, small the, the agency has goals that they need to meet for their small business utilization. And the way that they, the way that you prove to them that you fit into these different categories, whether it be woman-owned, um, uh, disadvantage, economically disadvantaged, those type of things, is through your reps and certs. And so you need to read that section and make sure that you have all your ducks in a row there. And then section L is where there's going to be the instructions to the offers. That's important. You hope that that again, that's as specific as possible. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, but that's where they're going to tell you all about what they want to see out of your proposal. And then M is evaluation. This is very important, too. They're required to tell you how they're going to evaluate your proposal. And that gives you an advantage because you can um, evaluate your own proposal. You can um, grade yourself and, uh, and give yourself an idea of where your weaknesses are, where you need to work on. So how should you write your proposal? Um, we're going to look at an RFP here, and um, we'll see what what they're looking for out of your proposal. It's not coming up here. There we go. Okay, so this is section A. Um, this is a form that, that you're going to find on the front of all the proposals. Make sure you read through this. Sometimes there's some important information here. Sometimes there's stuff you need to fill out. Um, I'm gonna, this is a pretty long one, so I'm going to scoot through um, some of these sections. Um, but uh, Section B is where you, they're going to uh, line out the different, what they call CLINs. Those are the different sections of work. That's, that's a contracting term. That's how they're going to. That's how you're going to bill against the contract. So make sure you understand all of the information here. Uh, but for what we're talking about today, it's not going to be as important. Um, and that's uh, these. Each one of these sections can be quite long. And so in our example here, um, these these section. Each one of these sections are quite long. You can see that this this proposal or this RFP is almost 100 pages long. So this is a big one. Um, but it's very, it's very specific, so it's a good one to use as an example. Um, as we talked about, Section C is the statement of work. This is where they tell you about um, exactly what they want you to do. And again, this one is very specific. Um, they tell you um, there's going to be a research and development section. There's going to be an engineering section. There's going to be a modeling section. Um, this one's a very technical one. You know, if you're a uh, um, a lawn care company or you're, as we said, a painting company, um, this stuff is going to be obviously molded towards you. So don't be overwhelmed by the technical nature. Um, this one is just a, a technical RFP. So there's a lot of, um, as we looked at, there's a lot of sections here. Um, section F, deliveries. This is important too. Sometimes there'll be good information in here, sometimes not. Um, this one tells you um, where you're going to um, perform the work, that type of thing, when they expect it to be done. If we keep going here, um, Section H is special instructions. So um, they give you information about insurance that you're going to need. Anything that's unique to this proposal um, will usually be found in Section H. If we keep going, We'll find um, I and K. Um, in section J um, is again the um, the list of 
attachments. Um, in this proposal, there was um, four or five, I think. Yeah, four attachments here. So that's important um, that you look and make sure you have a, have everything here. Sometimes it's real important. Sometimes it's just a list of acronyms, which is important. Um, <clears throat> but um, one great thing on this one is they gave us a summary of everything that that all the forms that you would need to fill in. So that was very helpful. So make sure you check that list. Um, again, here's your representations and certifications. So anything that you need to uh, prove to the government, if you're a small business, that type of thing, uh, make sure you check that section. A lot of times there'll be forms in that section that you need to fill out, or they'll give you a place online to go and fill out forms. So um, be sure that you check that as well. Um, and then so we get to um, section L. And again, this is where, one of those places where you're going to spend a lot of time because this gives you all of the um, instructions about your proposal, everything you need to know um, to write a, a competent proposal. So for instance here, they tell you when it's due, where to send it. Um, I've highlighted, so the, the yellow highlighting is mine, that's not in the original. Um, so these are just some important things that you want to pull out. And a lot of uh, a great technique to use is to create a checklist using section L. So every time you see one of these important items, like the date, the address, um, pull that out into a checklist so that when you get ready to, to send your proposal in the process of writing, you can check those things off to make sure you have all their requirements fulfilled. So we can keep going down here. Um, in this proposal, they wanted you to submit um, an entire copy of the RFP, so you would need to print out the RFP and sign it, send that back in. You won't see that on all of them. That's not a, a real common thing. Um, <clears throat> but you can see here that they listed everything. So, and then a copy of your proposal. Um, this one even included a CD-ROM of the proposal. This one, again, was a pretty big one, so they wanted an electronic copy of that. Um, but all those things are listed here. So you would pull those out into a checklist, into a separate document, where you could make sure and check those off before you mail your proposal to make sure you have all the requirements fulfilled. They tell you what format that they want it in, Microsoft Office. Um, on the outside of the CD-ROM, they tell you what to write on there. All this would go into your checklist. They tell you that before you can submit, you need to go to this website and register your company. All this information is very important, so you want to make sure you read this section very carefully. By the time you're done with the proposal, you'll probably have this section memorized. Then this one, they even tell you the await the date that they expect to award the contract. You won't see that very often, and when you do, it's usually wrong. But um, again, this is a very a very detailed RFP, so they included a lot of that information here. They even tell you exactly how big the paper is, um, what kind of graphics they want, um, what kind of margins to use on your paper. <clears throat> Make sure that you follow all these to a T because. Um, if they receive um, a large number of proposals, they don't want to read all of those. And so any time that they can eliminate your company, you give them a good reason to eliminate your company, they'll, they'll use that. And so um, don't think that you can get away with these things, these are suggestions. Make sure you follow all these to achieve. Put all of these in your checklist. Um, <clears throat> they even tell you uh, for each section um, how, what the page limit is. Uh, most proposals have a page limit on them, so pay careful attention to these items here. Um, each section has its own page limit. And then in each section, they tell you specifically what they want to see. Put your DUNS number on the cover letter. Put your TIN on the cover letter. Um, all those type of things. So read this section very carefully. Know it very well, because um, this is going to be where you get most of your information from um, as far as the outline of your proposal and the format and those type of things. Section M, um, again, <clears throat> there's some very specific stuff in here that's going to be helpful to you. Um, they tell you each evaluation factor and um, the ratings that they use for each one of those, how they're going to judge it. They have to tell you the process that they're going to go through. And so you'll want to read this very carefully because that can give you some additional information some things you may want to focus on over other things. Um, for instance, <clears throat> right here, they tell us that factor one, technical capability, is more important than factors two and three. 
very helpful information when you're writing the proposal. So make sure that um, LNM you know um, just about by heart. All right, so again, that was a very detailed, a very long RFP. Most of them aren't going to be that way, um, but it's good to use to see um, what it looks like and what um, type, type of information you want to get out of there. So let's look at some um, techniques that you're going to want to use when you're writing, the, when you get down to writing. Um, the first thing you need to do is focus on benefits, focus on your customer. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but if you're constantly talking about your company and the features that you have, <clears throat> that's great, but they get tired of hearing everybody says their company is the greatest. And so what you want to do is put the focus on them and the benefit that you're going to give them. Um, so instead of saying, well, we'll talk about that a little bit later. We'll get into more detail on that. Um, write to the audience. Um, you know, uh, you can probably get a good idea of who's going to be, who, uh, what type of agency you're talking to. And so... Um, use terms that they're familiar with and those type of things. Don't assume anything. That's, that's very important. That should run throughout your entire proposal. Um, don't assume that they know anything. Be very explicit. Don't assume that they can make the connections between your um, past performance and, your, and what you're telling them about your skills. <clears throat> make that very specific. Say, um, the reason I know that paintbrushes uh, work best is these three projects that I've worked on. Use good style, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And use an attractive format. Those are not as important, um, <clears throat> but they'll help set yourself apart. So again, um, you want to talk about benefits, not the features. You know, when we go into the store, you know, we see a drill that has uh, 16 speeds, and next to it is a drill that has 10 speeds. Um, a lot of times we'll just we'll buy, you know, and it's it's let's say it's five dollars more. We'll just buy it just because it has more speeds. The government does not work like that. You can't tell them um, <clears throat> I use paint brushes or I use a spray gun to paint. Um, you have to tell them specifically why that is better. So um, <clears throat> you can say um, I use a spray gun because. Um, that helps me finish the job faster, there's less dripping, all of those type of things. Don't assume that they know any of that. You can't just tell them, I'm using the spray gun. You have to tell them why that's better. And put that up front. Make sure that that's the first thing that they see is why you're, you're better, your method is better. Um, <clears throat> when you're writing, keep your evaluators in mind. Usually evaluators um, are not happy about reading a proposal. They're that's not what they do full time. They have another job and they get pulled off of their job to come and read your proposal. So you want to make their job as easy as possible. Um, they don't know who you are. They don't know anything about you. Even if they do know something about you, they can't use that information unless it's in your proposal. So again, be very specific. Make their job easy. And we're going to talk about a few ways you can make their job easy. The first one is um, <clears throat> top-down writing. Generally, I, I had a history teacher in high school, and he would tell us, um, he taught us how to do the funnel introduction. And what you do is you start very generic, you make some generic statements, and you get more and more specific. And then the last statement, the last sentence in your introduction paragraph was our thesis statement. And so we wrote hundreds of those. Um, we would start broad and get specific. The proposal writing, you want to be the opposite. You want to give them the main point right out of the gate because you don't know how long they're going to read down through that paragraph before they get tired and jump down a little bit. So tell them right in the beginning, my company is the best because I, I use spray guns, and that's better than uh, – then, then you can go through the, the paragraph and give them more details on why that's better, those type of things. But you want to give them uh, the main point right up front, very first sentence. The very first sentence of each paragraph should be the main point. The very first paragraph of each section should be the main point. Um, <clears throat> another thing you can do to make their job easier is to um, write to the RFP. Use all the language um, that they use in the RFP. So if you're used to using, um, <clears throat> if you're used to using the term um, purchase order and they say work order, um, use their term. Don't be stubborn about it. Um, that makes their job easier. They don't have to 
to translate anything. Again, don't assume that they're going to translate because they may not. Um, be very specific. Um, use your um, checklist. Um, like I said, um, the checklist is very important. The guy on the other side of the table is going to be using the checklist too. So the more you can make your proposal line up with what they asked for, the easier their job is because they can go straight down their checklist. And we'll look at a good way to do that a little bit later. So um, <clears throat> constantly refer back to your checklist, to the RFP, to make sure that you um, stay in compliance with those things. Again, I, like I said before, justify everything that you say, support everything that you claim you can do. Um, the best way to do that is with experience. As a new business, you might, all, you might not always have experience, so you're going to have to find other ways to do that. You can say, I'm certified. You can say, um, you know, my employees have these uh, certifications. They have these skills. Avoid fluff. Um, anything that, that's, that's just um, small talk, that type of thing, you want to clean all of that out of there. That's just stuff that's going to get in the way of getting your point across. Um, use simple, straightforward language. Um, don't use big words, those type of things. Avoid arrogance. Um, again, every company is going to say that they're the best. You avoid that by putting the focus on the customer, talking about how all the benefits that they're going to get by using your company, not all the great features your company has. Um, and don't put down the competition. And this is what we talked about a little earlier um, as ghosting. You never want to mention your competition by name. So if you're the guy with the spray gun, and you know that um, the, the guys who use the paintbrushes, the paint always drips on the bushes and kills the customers, the azaleas. Well, you don't want to say, company A always is going to kill your bushes because um, their paintbrushes drip. That's not what you want to do. Um, that makes you look petty, and it's just, um, it's just poor technique. So what you want to do is, ghosting is when you say, um, our spray guns do not drip. They're safe for plants. If you know that your customer has a problem in one area, you want to call out how that is not a problem for your, your uh, techniques and how your techniques avoid those problems that your competitors have without ever mentioning them by name. That's a fun, that's a fun thing to do, um, but you want to make sure you don't go overboard with that. Avoid um, non-responsiveness. This is some, um, this is a, um, an important thing because a lot of times um, if you feel like you're weak in one area of the, of the statement of work or something like that, you'll just leave that out of your proposal. That's, that's kind of tempting to do. Um, never do that. You need to, that's called answering the mail. Everything that they ask for, you need to give them some response, even if it's, we don't have experience in this area, but blah, blah, blah. We're certified in this. We think that this project we did is similar, those type of things. A lot of times they'll ask you to um, show understanding of the requirements. And so you can't just say, if they say, um, we want you to paint all the trim. You can't just say, we understand that you want us to paint the trim. You have to show um, your techniques for painting the trim, those type of things, so that they know you understand what they're asking for. Sometimes that one's difficult, um, but you need to work hard at that. And again, empty claims. Don't, don't just say that um, you're going to paint the trim. You know, tell them um, all the great ways that you do that, the history that you have, um, certifications that you have, those type of things that back it up. Graphics. Um, graphics can be a great way to make the proposal reader's job easier. They'd much rather look at pictures than read text. We all would. Um, the thing is, you don't want to go overboard. Um, don't use too many graphics. Some people um, want to use one graphic per page, and that's kind of a rule of thumb. Um, you know, make sure that the graphic, that's fine, one per page. Um, make sure that everyone is there for a reason, though. Don't say anything with graphics that's not in your text, and don't say anything that, um, so that the, that the graphics support what's in your text, because what they're going to do is, if they turn to a page and there's a picture on there, that's where your eye goes immediately. So um, you want to um, get the main point across in a graphic, and then if they want to read supporting information, they can read your text. Um, check for restrictions. Some proposals say don't use graphics. Some say we only want flowcharts. Um, so make sure you read that section L and make sure that um, you're compliant with those regulations. Another great way 
that you can uh, make the proposal reader's job easier is to use a matrix um, like this. So what we've done here is we've taken section L, um, each, each subsection within section L, um, listed all of that, the titles of each section. So in section L, um, 2.A on page 1 of the RFP, they asked for an executive summary and contact info. So what we do is we come on the right side and say, okay, that's going to be in volume one of our proposal, and it's on this page. And that makes, like I said, they're usually working from a checklist too. So that makes it very easy to run down this section and say, okay, check, they've got that, they've got that. A lot of times they'll tear this, this page out of your proposal and set it on the desk next to them and use that as their checklist. So this is a really valuable tool really makes their job easier, and um, anytime you can make their job easier, the better it is for you. So writing style. Um, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this. Um, it's important um, that you be clear and concise in your writing, um, but, um, but don't, don't worry too much over this. You know, you'll get better at this um, as you go. Um, again, the most important thing about style is be clear um, and be, um, don't make their job hard, as we've said before. The, the less clear you are, the harder their job is, the more likely they are to just going to skip down a section and miss something important that you have. Um, this is something that you see a lot, the top one there, do not write anything that you wouldn't say, uh, that you wouldn't, any sentence that you wouldn't speak. I don't really like that. Um, I, I highlighted in red. Um, you hear that a lot, but that's not really how you write um, a proposal. You wouldn't um, you wouldn't speak to someone like that, and so uh, you don't want to use um, any slang, contraction, jar, uh, jargon. Um, gender related terms are best just to avoid altogether, <clears throat> wherever possible. Um, obscure words. Don't try to use big words or important sounding words. <clears throat> be very clear. Um, and kind of the rule of thumb there at the bottom is if you keep having to open a thesaurus or if you think your punctuation's um, wrong, something like that, you're probably being too complex. You need to simplify um, what you're saying. Verbs. Um, th again, this goes back to, to your school days. I'm sure your teacher told you all the time that, that, uh, that you need to be using active voice instead of passive voice. Um, try to, I'll, I'll say that try to do, try to use active voice as much as possible. It's not, um, you know, don't knock yourself out trying to get rid of every passive sentence in your whole proposal. It's okay to do that once in a while, um, but don't overdo it. Um, a good rule of thumb is to say um, you can use active, uh, passive voice when you want to, um, the, the action that's happening is more important than who actually did it. Or if you want to kind of sweep under the rug who did it. So if, you're, if your competitor came up with a technique that you're going to use, you wouldn't say that company A developed this technique. You would say um, this technique was developed and now we're going to use it. So um, with your tent, um, just be consistent. Um, a lot of people want to get rid of all the future tents in their proposal. That's a stronger way to write. Um, that's, that's a good technique. I would recommend that. Um, again, don't knock yourself out trying to do that, uh, but that is a stronger way to write. So instead of saying, we will paint the trim, then we will paint the house, then we will clean up, um, just pretend like you're already doing it. Say, we, first we paint the trim, then we paint the house, then we clean up. Um, act like you've already got the job and just write about it as if you were doing it now. Um, the one thing to remember is what is in the past is always past tense. So, if you're talking about a job that you did before, um, use past tense in that case. Um, kind of alluded to this earlier, but use the right words. Um, <coughs> if they, um, a lot of times there'll be terms in the in the RFP. You want to take those terms and uh, make a list of those. And so, again, if they call it a delivery order, and you're calling, you're used to calling it a work plan request. Don't be stubborn. Um, write that down and make sure that uh, keep a list of all those terms that they, that they use in the RFP and make sure you're using the same terms. Again, that goes back to making their job easier. You don't want to have to, them to have to translate 
uh, between the different types of terms. Don't assume that they're going to do that. Make it explicit. Um, and you should also, um, on that list of terms, you can keep um, acronyms, those type of things that are found in the, in the RFP. Um, define all of those and make sure that everybody who's involved in writing the proposal um, uses those terms consistently. Um, formatting, I'll say a little bit about formatting. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of the icing on the cake. If you have all these other things, um, then formatting is the final touch that's going to try to set your proposal apart, but um, it's not the most important thing that you can focus on. So worry about this one last. Um, again, go back to the RFP, follow any rules that are found in the RFP. That's your first step in formatting. When they talk about margins, they talk about font, make sure you have all of those bases covered. Other than that, just be consistent throughout your proposal. That's the most important thing. Don't be changing back and forth between fonts. Um, don't be using um, three different colors. Make sure everything is consistent. Um, use headers and footers. Um, most word processors um, you know, can, can handle those. Let, use that tool. That will help you make a lot of things simple. Your page numbers, um, your margins, those type of things. Um, simplifies a lot of work for you. Um, so use, uh, there's, there's plenty of other word processor tools out there. There's tools that will um, help you with your passive voice. I know Microsoft Word um, uh, through the grammar checker can help you uh, eliminate those passive voice, that type of thing. So learn your tools that you're using, your word processors. Um, you know, maybe you've got spreadsheets that go in there. Learn how to use those tools. Um, you know, if you have any questions on that type of stuff, send those to us. We'll help you out where we can. Um, and don't get too cute. Not a, don't go overboard again with graphics, um, <clears throat> with all of the formatting type stuff. Don't get cute with your fonts. Um, don't use script fonts and those type of things. Um, keep it simple. Um, keep it consistent are the most important things I can tell you there. Um, so now the next section is schedule. This isn't real important. Um, it's um, just some helpful information. Liz, how are we doing on time? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Well, let's. I'm just gonna. Uh, I'm just gonna scoot through this real quick so we have time for questions. Uh, this is um, an ideal schedule. Your schedule is not gonna look like this. Um, my schedule never looks like this, even though we've been doing this for five years. Um, it never works out this way. Uh, but this is an ideal schedule. Um, you've got capture management. That's not really within the, the um, context of this proposal. We can talk about that later. Uh, but um, that's all the things you do building up to when the proposal comes out. Sometimes they'll issue a draft proposal or an RFI. So that's kind of when you start writing. As soon as they issue that draft, you're going to want to start breaking it down. It's not going to change a whole lot from the draft to the final. Um, when the final RFP comes out, um, you want your draft ready. Uh, start working on that. Do your outline. Do all those things that we talked about. Check the RFP. Uh, make sure that you're consistent there. Um, some people call the, the first draft review the pink team. Again, we talked about that in the beginning. The color names, the team names are not important. That just means your first draft review. Um, the second uh, review of your, the, the, the review of your second draft is sometimes called a red team. Again, not real important, the name of it. Um, that's where you make sure you've addressed all the things from the first review. And then um, <clears throat> after, you, after you've addressed all of those things in the second draft, um, then you want to do your formatting. You want to make sure all your um, T's are crossed and your I's are dotted and those type of things. That's your final review. And then the gold team, um, some people call it a white glove review. That is the final review to make sure nothing's out of place. Um, if you find a big error, you can fix that, but usually small errors you're going to leave because you've got to go ahead and ship it. Um, <clears throat> so you'll submit your proposal. Make sure you submit in time. Um, if you have to mail your proposals, a lot of them these days are going to email, electronic, but if you have to mail it, leave yourself enough time for it to get there. <clears throat> and then um, sometimes there'll be oral arguments. That means uh, they'll come back and pick the top three proposals and ask for you to defend your your proposal orally in front of a board. Um, that will usually be listed in the RFP, so <clears throat> if your proposal has that, if your RFP has that in there, be ready for that. Start preparing for that um, right from the beginning. And then out here you have your award <clears throat> where you um, hopefully you'll win. Um, follow a lot of these 
um, techniques, and I know that you'll be um, you'll be on the top of the pile at least. <coughs> um, <coughs> so we're going to breeze. These are these are schedule stuff. We're going to breeze through these. The summary is: remember, low risk the whole time throughout the entire proposal. You need to be showing the government how you are you are less risky than your competitor. Focus on benefits instead of features. Tell them why it's better to spray the house than to paint the house. Don't just tell them you're going to spray it. Be very explicit on why that's better. Don't assume anything. Again, explicit. Place the important material first. Every section should start with the most important paragraph. All the most important information should be at the beginning of the paragraph. Answer the mail. Again, <clears throat> all the sections, all the sections of the um, of the statement of work. All the sections of the proposal, even if you're weak in that area, put something down. You need something there, there or you're not going to be compliant. And write clearly. Um, those are the most important things that, um, that you can remember. Um, <clears throat> I want to give credit. Um, I, I put this proposal, this uh, presentation together uh, from a couple of different sources. Uh, Alan Rupar at CSC had a big hand in it, so I want to give him credit. And um, again, we're going to put the we're going to put the whole presentation up on the website. You should be getting an email in a couple of days with a follow-up on how to find that, how to find the recording, uh, and um, we'll have all the questions up there as well. If you have any questions or comments, whether it be about the material we've covered today or about uh, Magnolia Business Alliance, anything like that, um, you can send those to Lori Moran. I'll put her um, email up there. Um, she can. Any questions you have about the material, you can send those to her. Um, if you think of something tomorrow or the next day or a week from now, send those to her. She'll get in touch with me, and I'll get back with you on those things. Um, so um, Joel's been answering questions as we went. Um, <clears throat> are there any questions that we have that we want to answer um, in front of everybody? If you have a question that you want to uh, ask in front of the group, um, on the right side of your screen, uh, there's a button to raise your hand. Um, if you click that button, um, you can raise your hand, and uh, we will um, we will call on you um, as we see those. Um, <clears throat> are there any questions that came in over the chat that we want to answer? No. No questions. No questions at this time. Not seeing any. Questions? Anybody? Okay. Well, we'll stay on the line uh, for a couple oh, minutes if you, if you think of anything. Okay. <laughs> Margaret, all right. Margaret, do you have a question for the group? Yes. yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, I can. Yeah. Um, I'm a new business, and you mentioned earlier that uh, sometimes past performance, no past performance, may not necessarily um, the score against you. Can Can you elaborate a little more on that, and and, and give me like in a for instance? Yeah, sure. Um, generally what happens is um, <clears throat> in most proposals um, that you'll see, past performance is um, it's a um, addition. So let's say they'll say if you don't have any past performance, it's not a negative score, it's a zero. So you don't get counted off for not having past performance, but people that do have past performance get a positive score. So that's one way. Um, that past performance, uh, technically it doesn't hurt you, um, but if you're going up against other companies who have a lot of experience, obviously you're going to be a, at a disadvantage. But generally the government is not allowed to count against you just because you haven't done it before. Now, if you don't have a lot of experience, um, some of the ways that you can get around that. Um, you can um, cite certifications, um, any education that you have, um, that is um, relevant to the work that you're going to be doing. Um, certifications can be uh, company-wide, uh, or it can be employees. So any, if you, if, again, going back to the house painter example, if you're, uh, one of your painters has a, a certification from the American Painters Association that says he's a high-quality painter, um, you're going to want to mention those. Um, it's not as good as past performance. It's not as good as concrete experience of you doing it, um, but it's a way to mitigate that risk. Um, <clears throat> also, one important technique you can use is to use the experience for employees. And um, 
So let's say your company doesn't have experience painting um, large scale um, buildings or something, but you hired a guy and he has that experience. That's a way um, that you can list that as past performance a lot of times. Um, check the regulations in the RFP, make sure of that, but um, typically um, an employee's experience can count um, for your company's experience. So when he, if you just got one guy who has an experience in the area that you're working on, list that um, and that's a way to mitigate that risk as well. Did you did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Thank you very much. Okay, great. Are there any other questions out there? Okay. Well, again, you can email your questions to the email address on the screen. Um, I'll hang on the on the line a couple minutes here in case anyone um, comes up with anything. But um, we thank you for for participating. Um, we hope you learned something new, um, something helpful that will help, help you win some business. <clears throat> and uh, like I said, look out in the next couple of days. You should get a follow-up email with uh, more information on how to access the, the presentation. I'll even put the, uh, materi the supporting materials that we used up there, and um, there will be a survey in there as well. We'd love to hear your feedback on, um, <clears throat> on those things so that we can improve our services. Thank you, everyone. Um, if you have any suggestions or comments for future topics, please send those along as well. Um, we're always looking for great ideas. Um, again, my name is Liz. Your presenter today was Mark Stevens. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to give us an email or a call. The phone number for the Magnolia Business Alliance is 228-295-7117. Thanks, everybody. Have a good afternoon. And if you think of a question here uh, in the next couple of minutes, just raise your hand and Liz will, um, Liz will get you put through. I'll stay on a few minutes to, to wait for any of those. But probably what's going to happen is you're going to think of something tomorrow or you're going to download the presentation and think of a question. So just email those along.